but I wanted to welcome you to the second of Peter McDonald's 2022 Rosenbach Lectures. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Lynn Farrington. I'm the Senior Curator and Director of Programs in the Kislak Center, as well as Chair of the Rosenbach Advisory Committee. And for those of you who are not here yesterday, we are pleased to announce that the 2023 Rosenbach Lectures will be given by Leah Price, of Rutgers University, and the 2024 by Elizabeth McHenry of New York University. So we have an exciting lineup for the next couple of years. I do wanna to mention to everybody that there will be a Q&A after Peter's lecture, so please stay on Zoom for the Q&A. And for those of you who are local, he will be giving an informal seminar tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. to noon in the Henry Charles Lee Library up here on the sixth floor of Van Pelt Dietrich Library. Please join us um, in reflecting with him on the institution of literature and topics that he's been speaking about during his lectures. Penn Press has pulled together a book display across from the elevators and is offering a 40% discount on titles from its material text and other series. For those of you who are viewing on Zoom, you can access the list and the discount at https colon backslash backslash site site dot penpress dot org slash Rosenbach dash 2022 backslash. The link was included in the email that you received today with the Zoom information. Rita Barnard, who will be giving tonight's introduction, is Professor of English and Comparative Literature and Director of the Undergraduate Program in Comparative Literature at Penn. She holds a secondary position as Extraordinary Professor at the University of the Western Cape and has been a visiting professor at Brown and a Mellon Distinguished Lecturer at the University of the Witwatersrand. Her scholarly interests lie in modernism and global modernities, South African literature and cultural studies, modern American literature, especially the literature and cultural politics of the 1930s, contemporary cinema and the novelist genre. In addition to articles in numerous journals, she has served until recently as editor of Safundi, the Journal of South African and American Studies. She is the author of The Great Depression and the Culture of Abundance, Cambridge 1995, and Apartheid and Beyond, South African Writers and the Politics of Place, Oxford 20, 2006. And the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Nelson Mandela, Cambridge 2014, and co-editor with Andrew Van Der Vlees of South African Writing in Transition, Bloomsbury 2019. She's currently working on books on South African modernisms and post-apartheid cinema and society, along with the film, and I'd like to know more about this, Imploding City. Um, please welcome Rita Barnard, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Well, thank you, Lynn. I wasn't expecting to be introduced so fulsomely. Uh, I was very focused on, on Peter, I'm so glad. Uh, to, since I was so graciously welcomed by uh, Peter McDonald to Oxford University, I'm so happy that you put me in the position where I could welcome him uh, in return. So tonight's uh, lecture is called The Lure of Literature, Books, History, and the State. Uh, and our guest, whom, whom many of you have already met with the previous lecture, is uh, uh, Peter McDonald. Professor of English and Related Literature and Fellow of St. Hugh's College, Oxford. He is the author of Artifacts of Writing, his um, book on Arnold, uh, uh, The Literature Police, Apartheid Censorship and Its Cultural Consequences, and British Literary Culture and Publishing Practice, uh, 1880 to 1914. So in a way, I think of Peter also as a modernist. Um, so, as a South African and a student of South African literature, I can truly attest to the enormous importance and originality of his book, uh, Peter's book, The Literature Police, uh, Apartheid Censorship and Its Cultural Consequences. It really was, uh, I think this is fair to say, the first sociology of literature, um, the first uh, meditation on literary institutions, 
uh, the emphasis in the, in South Africa, the, the the work had always been uh, interpretive in nature, so a massively important and wonderful work, um, a work that shows how, in complicated ways, the censors were, uh, in a way, the guardians of the literary, or at least what. Uh, we were permitted to think of as the literary. Um, if you go to Peter's website or to the book itself, you'll see that it's lauded by the likes of J.M. Kutsi, Andre Brink, Anki Kroch, uh, the cream of the crop of South African writers. Um, Kutsi, in particular, uh, lauds uh, this work as essential for understanding the forces forming and deforming literary production in South Africa during the apartheid years. And those of you who know could see would emphasize that word deforming, right? Um, in fact, I think that uh, it's probably only could see himself who has more interesting things to say about the work of the censor uh, in South Africa. Anki Kroch, uh, a brilliant and dear friend, uh, describes Peter's work as a gift. And I would say that it is a gift that keeps on giving through uh, the website where fascinating materials for literary history uh, keep being, uh, are available and, and keep being added to. I also recalled as I was uh, asked to do this introduction, a, a wonderful essay uh, that uh, Peter once published on Kutsi's Diary of a Bad Year and much more, as is his uh, want. It's an essay that balances uh, or, or perhaps puts into cont uh, 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 contention the idea of the politics of interpretation and the ethics of reading. Uh, 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 an essay that, again, returns so beautifully to the idea of, uh, well, to what defines literature. Um, now, Peter, I don't know if you know this, but I was the reader this. So I was, I, I encountered this essay anonymously and I read along and I said, my goodness, this is like, this is mature. This is, this is much more than a reading of this very difficult and uh, intriguing novel. And I, I always taught it actually in my uh, pro seminar where I introduced grad students to reading and to the profession. So uh, it's a piece that I really, really value. And, um, and uh, enjoyed recalling today. So by the sound of it, uh, this lecture uh, with its re-engagement uh, with the relationship between literature and the state, um, sounds like Peter is back to the very themes that throughout have made his oeuvre so engaging and important. His concerns in uh, these Rosenbach lectures have been, as, as the very interesting little blurb uh, you made available for us uh, puts it, uh, concerned with the fugitive inward practice of reading. And I would say inward, yes, but I'm sure we will find today always political as well, always affected by institutions. These meditations feel especially important to me in the the present climate. Um, reading certainly is never easy to understand. I mean, there is something so strange about reading. Like, you know, you look at these marks on the page and somehow, you know, things come up in your mind, right? Um, I am somebody who's found reading incredibly difficult to do in the Trump era. Uh, it feels to me that with, you know, the fracturing of our attention with clashing uh, media, um, sustained reading has become more mysterious and more difficult than ever before. Um, so I cannot think of a better moment at which to re-examine, along with our speaker, Peter McDonald, the secret life of reading. So thank you. and and. It's delightful to have you here at Penn, Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Rita. Um, I was just thinking maybe that for people who weren't here yesterday, uh, just to give you a, a, a heads up, um, I, 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 I use the word I uh, throughout this piece, but uh, these, these throughout these lectures, but in a, in a slightly different way. And you'll start to see very quickly, if you weren't here yesterday, that I have a sidekick who's called uh, Professor McDonald. Um, 
but I am speaking in a slightly different voice um, for this particular topic and these sorts of materials. Um, perhaps I should also say that maybe even uh, if for those of you who read Beckett, I say I, unbelieving, but I do say I. So I began the first lecture discussing Robert Danton's doubts about our ability to investigate what he called the communication circuit's ultimate stage, the reader's inner appropriation of books. That's his phrase. Today, I'd like to start by considering a question at the opposite end of the inner outer scale. Um, let's just see, are we, have we got the slides working? Yes. Um, from Thomas Adams uh, and Nicholas Barker in 1993 to Sarah Bruett in 2019, the difficulty many commentators have had with Danton's model of the circuit, which you can see here, is not that it freezes human beings and their inner reading lives out of history, which is an, a, an anxiety that Danton had uh, even in 1982. Rather, it freezes history out of book history, or more precisely, it consigns what Danton called outside influences, that is the larger social, economic, political, intellectual, and legal forces beyond the circuit, to a simplified Venn diagram at, at its center, a lead Murray and Squires followed for their updated digital model of the circuit in 2012. To rectify this, Adams and Barker in 1993 made two key changes to their proposed alternative. They replaced Danson's eight agents with five events in the middle, you can see, publication, survival, manufacture, etc. And they put the circuit inside the whole socioeconomic conjuncture, as they called it, as you can see on the top, identifying particular points at which its impact is likely to be most acute. So social behavior and taste, for instance, have a special bearing on reception, commercial pressures on distribution, and so on. My professorial research assistant contributed to these debates in the 1990s, pointing to the ways in which Pierre Bourdieu's structural sociology of fields offered other ways of refining Danton's model. In her most recent critique, Sarah Bruett was characteristically more severe. Besides accusing Danton of Eurocentrism, she took issue with his model because it relegates, as she put it, these are her words, it relegates to its margins the question of how the circuit's entire functioning relates with other systems, economic, social, political, and cultural in the surrounding environment. As such, it fails to deal adequately with material realities and structures of power that have what she called, what Sarah Barrett called, determinative consequential force. That's a phrase I'm gonna keep coming back to in this lecture. Like my professorial assistant, I share many of these questions about the conceptual and methodological limitations of the model Danton himself revisited in 2007. For the professor, one key co concern centers on the determinative force of those outside influences. Yet when it comes to this central, question, this central issue, he is as troubled by the ongoing vagueness of the revised Adams Barker model as he is doubtful about Sarah Bruett's confidently knowing Marxist-inspired materialism. For me, however, the difficulties are more concrete and inevitably experiential. Hence the threefold question I would like to ask today. First, looking at the criticisms of Danton's model from my perspective, which outside influences were most significant when it came to the development of my reading brain. Second, how exactly did they intersect with the circuits through which I first gained access to books? And third, what, if any, determinative force did these circuit refracted outside influences have on my biocultural story of inner appropriation? I sketched some preliminary answers to the questions when I discussed Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat at the end of the first lecture yesterday. 
As you'll recall, the circuit in that case extended over 12,000 kilometers from New York to Cape Town via London. And the external factors shaping it included the intellectual influences of the Cold War literacy debates in America of the 1950s, the commercial pressures of the essentially colonial Anglograph book trade in the 1960s, my mother's social behavior and taste, and the political influences, once again, of the Cold War. To these, I would now add the political, legal, and religious influences of the apartheid state, even though its impact was minor uh, in this instance because the Cape Town customs officials never submitted the cat in the hat to the censors. At most, since all imports had to be vetted, we could say that it received their tacit approval. They clearly didn't worry about absconding mothers. <laughs> Did these multiply tangled outside influences and structural realities have any determinative consequential force? In deeply neurological terms, as I suggested yesterday, the answer is yes. By enhancing my phonemic awareness, my mother's repeated readings of The Cat in the Hat helped nurture my pre-reading brain, turning me from, as I said yesterday, a linguistically open citizen of the global village into a more neurologically attenuated denizen of the English language. For Louis Menon, again referring to yesterday, this made Dr. Seuss's brilliantly inventive book, what he said, one of the Cold War's most potent unguided missiles. A colorful phrase containing an element of truth, though as I argued, the missile in my case was not unguided. Much the same colonial era story could be told for most of my early encounters with books in the so-called private sphere of the family household. Given the relatively modest scale of English language publishing in the South Africa of the 1960s, roadmaps, local history, photography, bird and cookery books, not children's reading, dominated the local market. More or less everything else emanated from London. Things were of course very different when it came to Afrikaans and African language books. And with only a few very notable exceptions, the well-worn London circuit continued to dominate the next major turn in my developmental story, which sees the scene shift from home to the schoolroom and from books chosen chiefly by my mother to the officially prescribed reading materials um, that over the course of a decade or so saw me gradually turn from pre-reader to novice to orthographically competent 10-year-old decoder, and then to increasingly fluent, even quasi-automatized teenage comprehender. This extended initiation took me from the partly book-based phonosphere of my early years to the graphosphere proper. Much to my mother's dismay, it also brought home the reality that I was, like her, and around 22 million others in 1970s South Africa, already part of a much larger, but very different written world as well. Though that is certainly not how she would have described it at the time. Like the more familiar written world of the pre-digital era, this other one was made of paper, ink, and print but it was not authored in the ordinary sense. It did not remain confined between the covers of a book or even in bookshops and libraries. And it had real determinative consequential force. I am of course talking about the entire political and statutory apparatus of the apartheid state. Like a monstrous one-eyed cyclops, this other system to recall Bruet's phrase, imposed its own forms of legibility, evicting communities, segregating beaches, prohibiting interracial sex, banning books, dividing, dividing, deforming, and destroying lives. It also constituted one of the most potent outside influences on the circuits through which my early reading brain developed. There is perhaps nothing very surprising in all this. As the political scientist and anthropologist James C. Scott 
has long argued, writing has always been an instrument and expression of state power. Scott himself focused on the ancient states of Zomia in Southeast Asia. Since at least the late 19th century, moreover, the modern state has actively and directly promoted mass literacy. Britain passed legislation to establish its first state-funded primary schools in 1870, for instance, an example the British Cape Colony followed. And by the 1930s, as we mentioned yesterday, the success of the Soviet Union's ambitious literary, literacy program was widely recognized, even envied. The same cannot be said of post-war South Africa. When the white supremacist National Party came to power in June 1948, at six months before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was published, it immediately set about remaking the already segregated education system in its own atavistic image. This had particularly devastating consequences for black children born after the 1950s, as the iconic 1976 student Soweto uprising revealed. The degraded and degrading system established under the so-called Bantu Education Act, as it was officially called of 1953, was designed not only to remodel or shut down the mission schools of the colonial era, but to eliminate the class of black urban professionals they sometimes produced, creating a mass disenfranchised underclass instead. By contrast, the white schools following the policy of what was officially called Christian national education were tasked with ensuring that, I'm quoting from official documents, the European remained the torchbearer in the vanguard of Western civilization in South Africa. So how exactly did this looming outside influence impact the educational circuits in which I participated from 1970? At one level, the answer is brutally material in Bruet's sense. The system invested around 10 times more resource in my education than it did in any of my black compatriots. At another level, the answer is crudely ideological, again, in Bruet's sense. Besides bolstering white supremacy, apartheid education was designed to corral the entire population into separate, supposedly divinely ordained folke, the only, only the Afrikaans word will do, based on ethnicity, heritage, and above all, language. Hence the official hostility to dual medium schools and the sprawling state bureaucracy. There were no less than 18 separate education departments by the late 1980s. In my case, the bureaucratic conduit for the state's outside influence was the Cape Education Department, part of the semi-autonomous Cape Provincial Administration, itself a remnant of the 19th century British Cape Colony. Acting through a series of shadowy committees, which were guided by the broader policy of Christian national education, the Cape Department drew up lists of approved books from which individual schools under its jurisdiction made their own selections. So the, the department made a, a general list and schools selected. So if we go back to the Adams and Barker model, it was these committees rather than commercial pressures that had the greatest influence on the distribution of books. This is not to deny that publishers operating in the system including the local representatives of British publishers, did all they could to promote their own commercial interests, given the lucrative nature of the school book market, but they did so as lobbyists, not as decision makers. When it comes to understanding the effects of Adams and Barker's whole socioeconomic conjuncture, that you see how they've inserted a revised version of Danton's uh, circuit in, into the middle of that. When it comes to understanding the effects of that whole socioeconomic conjuncture, these bureaucratic minutiae matter. If you really want to trace these things, they were, they are, after all, what the schematic uh, um, broken line arrows in their diagram are intended to represent. And to use the rather affectless academic parlance of book history, 
They detail exactly how the political, legal, and religious influences relate to the circuit. From my perspective, these manushai matter for a more quirky reason as well, one that brings us back to the post-war pedagogical debates about early reading. As a product of the Cape Education Department, I was, unlike my counterparts in the north of the country, not subjected to the initial teaching alphabet, or ITA, a reading scheme James Pittman developed in the early 1960s in an effort to deal with English's notoriously opaque orthography. Taking inspiration in part from his grandfather, Isaac Pittman, who invented not just shorthand, but phonotypy, that was a form of phonetic writing and printing, the grandson devised a rationalized set of graphemes using a combination of standard Roman letters and special characters, each representing one of the main 45 or 46 uh, English phonemes. Though this made a kind of sense, it created an obvious problem. After developing a set of neural pathways for ITA, novice readers had to create another for the standard heterotypic orthography to use Isaac Pittman's damning label for unreformed English spelling. Not surprisingly, the experiment had a short life in the United Kingdom. But the Transvaal Education Department in the north of South Africa, an outlier in many respects, stuck with it well into the 1970s. The Cape Department, by contrast, followed the more mainstream trends across the Commonwealth and the United States at the time, which meant a categorical no to ITA, a slightly less emphatic no to phonics, and a yes to the so-called whole word and sentence methods. Following this policy, my primary school adopted two early readers. The Happy Venture series, the brainchild of the Australian educationalist Fred Chanel, which the Edinburgh publisher Oliver and Boyd launched in 1939, and the Ladybird keyword reading scheme, which the British remedial teacher William Murray developed with the Loughborough firm Wills and Hepworth in 1964. Neither scheme denied categorically the value of phonics, but both were clear that the focus in the initial years, so from age five to seven, roughly, had to be on what Chanel called the visual patterns of words and what Murray called simply sight words. These are Chanel's, Chanel's words. Psychological research confirms the opinion that for many pupils, the phonic method is too analytic, Chanel explained. They do not really understand what they're doing and not a few of them are mentally unable, this is from his uh, writings in the 1940s, are mentally unable to associate sounds with symbols and then to analyze and blend these as they find them in words. Besides, he said, phonics was too artificial. And he, he, he demonstrated this by citing these surrealistic examples from Alfred Hayes's introductory phonoscript primer of 1922. These were the kind of things that you, you used in the 1920s. The red hen is in the pen. The pig in a wig did a jig. The wig fell in a bog. This turn against phonics, which left little room for Louis Menon's magical duck rabbit moment with the word and, as we saw yesterday in the cat in the hat, or mine with the stop sign at the bottom of our road, has now largely been reversed. So much so that following the growing neuroscientific consensus, British legislators made teaching phonics in the early years a legal requirement in 2006. Yet on its own terms, the graphocentric post-war orthodoxy was progressively child-centered and scientific. Designed to be as visually appealing to their intended readership as possible, the Happy Venture and the Key Word series use short, short one-line sentences lengthening from one book to the next, and a large modernist sans-serif, very self-consciously modernist sans-serif type, which resembled as nearly as possible the print script children might be acquainted with in their own writing, as Chanel put it. The best-selling 56-page 
uh, ladybird books were a product of post-war paper restrictions. The format meant that 56 page format meant that each book could be printed on a single standard sheet of paper, minimizing waste and cost. But this material constraint also had the happy consequence of creating a colorful, cheap pocket hardback, perfectly suited for child size hands. According to the publishers, the keyword series, which was the most popular reading scheme in the United Kingdom by the mid 1970s, achieved an overall readership of 90 million. Sequencing the words as visual patterns was also carefully planned, moving in the case of the keyword series from an initial 12 to 100, 300, and up to 1,000 over the course of 36 books. Linking visual to speech and motor skills in a systematic way at each stage. This was all based on Murray's analysis of word frequency in children's book English, as he explained in the blurb for each book. Research shows that 12 of these keywords make up one quarter of all those we read and write. 100 of them form half, and 300 about three quarters of the total number of words found in juvenile reading. Reading skill is accelerated if these important words are learned early and in a pleasant way. So over the course of my first two school years from age six to eight, through, a uh, uh, through an iterative process of seeing, saying, and writing, these two series nurtured my brain's neural letterbox with minimal recourse to phonics, adding new visual and motor pathways to the sound templates I brought from home. First, for these, as you can see in this illustration, 12 sight words, and then building progressively to, uh, to 300 and more. So, um, so far, so graphocentric and neurological. Opposing the perceived artificiality of phonics, complicated matters, what Chanel called the real experiences of children were essential to this. It underpinned the sentence method, which foregrounded meaningful material rather than mere grapheme phoneme patterns, and it justified the careful choice of illustrations, which were intended, as he said, to portray, these are, these are Chanel's words, to portray the ideas of the printed material, providing further visual cues to aid word recognition. The more lavish full color illustrations in the keyword series were intended to create, this is again on the blurb, to create a desirable attitude towards learning. But they too made the graphemes, words, and sentences more meaningful by embedding them in an ostensibly recognizable world. Perhaps unsurprisingly, for a series of books created mainly by middle class, middle aged white men. The world was a utopian post-war English suburb, um, home to a happy, well-heeled white family of four, a housewife called Mummy, a breadwinner called Daddy, doll-loving girls called Jane or Dora, sporty boys called Dick or Peter, and dogs called Nip or Pat. If this was recognizable to some, it was fantastical to most, even in the Britain of the 1960s. In the context of apartheid South Africa in the 1970s, it was nakedly ideological in Bruet's sense. No doubt for the proponents of Christian national education, as my mother regularly pointed out, it was reassuring to know that generations of white English speaking children were inwardly appropriating their letters from books that conjured up a vision of Englishness as idealized and monochromatic as the segregated uh, suburbs in which they lived. In Britain, this fantastical ladybird vision came under attack on all fronts over the course of the 1970s, forcing Wills and Hepworth, who had by then been brought up by the much larger education firm Pearson, to rethink the illustrations, which gradually became more ethnically diverse and less crudely gendered, contributing to the ongoing, ongoing global success of the keyword series, even 
in late apartheid South Africa. I missed out on these revisions as a novice reader of the early 1970s, but I did encounter a ladybird image of blackness in the next stage of my initiation into, in, in the, into the English writing system. When independent, silent reading itself begins to propel our brain's development aged around 10, I worked my way through the school library's holdings of the very popular Ladybird Adventure from History series. I was especially drawn to the great civilization books, which included Greece, Rome, China, and the Incas, and ones about explorers, which ranged from Marco Polo and Christopher Columbus to Captain Cook and David Livingston. Because it featured a part of the world with which I had some familiarity, the latter left a particularly powerful impression. First published in 1960, Lady Bird's David Livingstone was, like over half the books in the history series, written by the popular British playwright and punch humorist Lawrence Dugard Peach. And I promise you, I'm not making up that name. It was his <laughs> Lawrence Dugard Peach, who took this writing commission on as a retirement project in his late 60s. Following Livingston's own missionary travels and researches in South Africa, a book he published in two editions in the 19th century, first in 1857, from which he quoted directly, Dugard Peach began his Ladybird account with a motivational portrait of the Scottish village boy as a self-improving reader. The first illustration shows the 10-year-old Livingston who was then working a 14 hour day on a, in a cotton mill, teaching himself Latin in the evenings, uh, obviously to the disapproval of his mother in, in, in some way. Unfortunately, though Livingston himself detailed his later commitment uh, to spreading literacy in Southern Africa in his, in his own travel, travelogues, there's a lot about his commitment to spreading literacy, uh, uh, Dugard Peach did not develop this theme nor did he quote this observation from Livingston's missionary travels. At one point, Livingston says, to all natives who have not acquired the art, the mode in which knowledge is conveyed through letters is unfathomable. It seems supernatural to them that we should distinguish things taking place in a book. Instead, de Peach championed Livingston as an intrepid missionary explorer who braved lions and, in his phrase, savage tribes, healed the sick, preached the gospel of peace, formed close interracial alliances, and heralded the ab abolition of the slave trade in what he called darkest Africa. This impeccably heroic vision, which again sat comfortably with the basic tenets of Christian national education, captured my 10-year-old imagination. Though as I started to question the history we were being taught at school, again, as usual, with my mother's promptings, I too began to wonder if the knowledge conveyed through letters was not, at times, supernatural. Like many of his post-war European and American counterparts, the Australian educationalist Fred Chanel saw literacy in unquestionably progressive terms. While serving various personal needs, as he put it, it raised, it raised social awareness, ensuring that every well-read child could become, as he put it again, an effective adult member of a democratic community. For a more critical take on po this post-war idealism, we need to look beyond the Euro-American world to figures like the Tamil philosopher Ananda K. Kumaraswamy, who denounced what he called the bugbear of literacy. Modern education imposed upon traditional cultures, for example, Gaelic, Indian, Polynesian, American Indian, he wrote in 1949, is only less deliberately, not less actually destructive than the Nazi destruction of Polish libraries. It's a long, passionate article. Yet, while Chanel was certainly among the post-war idealists, he was primarily a functionalist who saw reading only as a means to an end. This is what he put, how he put it. Pupils learn to read, at first largely orally and later silently, in order to understand the printed word. 
The ultimate objective is to understand the ideas, to appreciate the story, or to follow instructions, or to enjoy the beauty of the words and the rhythm, or to gain information from the written words of the author. Teaching the mechanics of reading is, in other words, all about turning diffident decoders into automatic comprehenders capable of looking through the printed word to the things it supernaturally conveys. Again, recall Reddy's conduit metaphor that I mentioned in the first lecture. Not just the meaning of the author's written words, but the ideas, the story, the instructions, the beauty or the information, or as Livingston put it in his Victorian idiom, knowledge. It certainly felt like a learned forgetfulness of writing or the printed word as such was the ultimate purpose of my own decade long school apprenticeship in reading. The object was to get information out of biology textbooks, to follow instructions for chemistry experiments, and when it came to literature, to understand the story, especially the plot, characters, and themes. Even poetry, which is no doubt what Chanel had in mind when he mentioned beauty and rhythm, was simply a resource for learning advanced literacy skills, the basics of meter, versification, poetic kinds, and figures of speech. This, at least, is how I found myself, aged 17, being taken in my final year of school through Hamlet, Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd, a poetry anthology, and a short story collection. No doubt the Cape Education Department's shadowy book committee thought, thought this canon of mainly English classics would facilitate the inner appropriation of my racialized ethno-linguistic identity as a privileged white English speaker, but there was little sense of this among my teachers who for the most part treated everything in a pragmatic Chanelian spirit as so much scholastic grist for the final examination mill. Increasingly disaffected, I groused my way through all this in a teenage fashion, saved somewhat by my mother, who as ever recommended alternative extracurricular reading. Eskian Pachlele's down second, autobiography down Second Avenue and George Orwell's down and out in Paris and London proved especially eye-opening for me as a 17 year old. Yet among the prescribed books, three works, one from the short story collection, the other two from the poetry anthology, hooked me like a lure, albeit almost incidentally. And this is one of the points I want to try to make in this lecture in terms of how we understand the force and power of institutions and the framing and, framing and presentation of works uh, to uh, students um, in the course of their studies. So the three works were Joseph Conrad's short story, The Secret Sharer, Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, and E.E. E. Cummings's R-P-O-P-H-E-S-S-A-G-R. -S -S Returning to these set books after four decades, what strikes me most is that this junction between my memory of first encountering these three works in the total existential situation of the time, to recall Walter Ong's phrase from yesterday. Um, so what I was talking about before we had a, a, a welcome break um, uh, was the, the I, I, I've just started talking about the disjunction between, I'm leading towards the disjunction between my memory of the first experience of these three works that I'm focusing on in particular, and um, how, if you like, the various institutional players and the books themselves, the apparatus around the books themselves was trying to encourage me, I would imagine, influence my appropriation of them. And so my first, my, my memory is of bewilderment and confusion. Um, and that was particularly in the case of uh, Conrad's The Secret Sharer, because I had read a lot of detective fiction and stories about crime and things like that, where the, the, the questions were resolved but nothing is resolved in the Conrad story. So for different reasons, puzzlement also dominated my response to the Thomas and Cummings poems. With Do Not Go Gentle, I remember getting the sonorous rhymes, 
and the heady drama of the five beat lines, I also understood the guiding metaphor about the night. And like the diligent student in this old school copy, it's not me, I'm afraid, I noted the puns, alliteration, and so on. What puzzled me were the repeated lines beginning, do not go, and rage, rage, which recur in a carefully patterned way, though I'm sure everyone who knows the poem. It's a villanelle, the teachers explained, a poetic form defined in part by its use of refrains. But why keep saying the same thing, I asked. After all, it's not as if we don't get it the first time. It's a villanelle, they said, and we moved on. The Cummings was perhaps more obviously perplexing. What was I supposed to do with this? Look at it or somehow try to say it aloud, like the Thomas poem, which seemed to ask to be read aloud. The teachers pointed me to the editorial note describing it as a technical exercise. A poet's attempt to convey, this is again the editor's note, to convey a, a, simple, a simple experience he had had, watching a grasshopper leap. But this did little to resolve my puzzlement, and again, we moved on. Yet by that point, the lure had done its trick, and I found myself increasingly, if often querulously, drawn to these strange, sometimes bewildering printed words, which the culture casually called English literature, but which I struggled to understand, let alone inwardly appropriate, as an otherwise fairly competent teenage comprehender. This, at least, is how the experience survives in memory. As I now realize, the editors of the anthologies had their own ideas about literature and reading, which were rather at odds with my inchoate feelings. Conrad's Secret Sharer was one of six stories included in the best-selling 20th century short stories, a self-consciously experimental school anthology first published in 1959 by the generally rather staid London educational firm George G. Harrop. But it was edited by two progressive British school teachers, Douglas Barnes and R.F. Egford, on behalf of the London Association for the Teaching of English, otherwise known as LATE. With LATE, L-A-T-E is the acronym, <laughs> with LATE, Barnes and Egg, which is still in existence, by the way, which is remarkable given the, the state of British education, that you've still got a fragile voluntary association operating. With late, Barnes and Eggford gave the collection its experimental edge. Founded in 1947, late was a small voluntary association committed to modernizing the post-war English school curriculum following the 1944 British Education Act. Among other things, the act made secondary schooling free for all in England and Wales. Strongly influenced by George Rood, the British Marxist historian, a background detail of which the Cape Book Committee was no doubt unaware, the group was determined to shake off the pedagogical ethos of the established grammar schools, to use the British terminology, and to promote a more socially inclusive curriculum for the emerging comprehensives, as they would become to come to be called. This meant moving away from the traditional approach to language study, which was Latinate, technical, and prescriptive, recognizing that language has a complex social life outside the classroom and affirming the children's own non-standard dialect. The group also embraced new media like film and television alongside literature, rejecting leverside hostility to mass culture and the related idea of the great tradition. Although you can see that this first book as you can see, is, is still, I think, very, very much under Levis's influence. Underpinning this framework were two essentially philosophical convictions. An acknowledgement of the diversity and primacy of what they called the child's experience, and a belief in the shaping power of language, its capacity, these, they, these are their words again, to deepen experience, order it, and make it accessible, make experience accessible. It is a commonplace that language helps us to think late argued in a pamphlet entitled The Aims of English Teaching from 1956. Our formulation 
implies also that language similarly helps us to perceive, feel, and act. So it's not just a cognitive matter. They're in tune with contemporary neuroscience in that respect, I think. Hence the particular value the group placed on modern literature and the historical span of the 20th century short stories, Late's first textbook. The earliest story dates from 1909, as you can see in this illustration, and the latest from 1954. This socially progressive uh, uh, philosophy explains Barnes and Egford's concern with what they called the reader's response. The aim of literary study, they insisted in the preface to 20th century short stories, is not the recital of those deadening facts from the story, that's code for grammar school scholasticism, but what they called sensitive reading. Oh, it looks like we might have crashed again. I see, okay, that's great. You, you did that. Uh, should I raise my hand to, if, if there's a problem with mine? Okay. Uh, no, I didn't get any of those. I'll, I'll continue and I'll just raise my hand if there's a problem. Um, so they, they, they said that not the deadening facts from the story, what they wanted to encourage was sensitive reading. And this is from their preface here. If read closely, these stories will lead into new places, the flow of our sympathetic consciousness. You can see that's a quotation. As a prefatory comment to a school anthology, this is not especially remarkable. The free, the free floating unattributed quotation simply rehearses a standard defense of literary study as a means of fostering sympathy, one that has a long pedigree in European thought. Traced to its original context, however, the quotation is a little more surprising, especially for an anthology first published in 1959. So if we can switch to the next one as well. It comes from Lady Chatterley's Lover, which even in the expurgated British edition of 1932 includes this narratorial comment on reading and the novel. And here lies the vast importance of the novel, says Lawrence's narrator, properly handled. It can inform and lead into new places the flow of our sympathetic consciousness, and it can lead our sympathy away in recoil from things gone dead, like grammar school scholasticism. Therefore, the novel properly handled can reveal the most secret places of life, for it is in the passional secret places of life, above all, that the tide of sensitive awareness needs to ebb and flow, cleansing and freshening. If this brings us back to the secret life of books and the history of sex, it also casts Barnes and Egford's idea of sensitive reading and their privileging of the reader's response over deadening facts in a rather different Laurentian light. At the same time, it opens up the possibility that some forms of literary writing might revitalize experience, not by ordering it as the late group, the late group claimed, but by disordering it, which comes a little closer to my own initial response to the secret sharer, especially if you substitute my disoriented reading brain for experience in late sense. Not that I noticed any of this at the time. Did my teachers? They never got the late memo about the deadening effects of scholasticism. And though Lady Chatterley's lover was finally unbanned in South Africa in 1980, they passed over the charged quotation without comment. Unlike 20th century short stories, Inscapes, the equally successful poetry anthology I read, was a local product edited by Robin Milan, a South African teacher who worked in exile in what was then called Swaziland, now Eswatini. It was produced in collaboration with the Cape Town branch of Oxford University Press and first published in 1969. Like the late anthology, however, Inscapes was a modernizing initiative focused on the student response and organized around the concept of experience 
hence the pointed subtitle, a collection of relevant verse. As Malana explained in the preface, the book was divided into two parts for a strategic reason. Part one, which was organized chronologically, was designed to appease the traditionalists in the profession. It ran through a selection of prescribed staples from Chaucer to Ted Hughes. By contrast, part two, which was arranged more eclectically, was intended to engage, these are Malan's words, the 16 or 17 year old living in South Africa, the 16 or 17 year old living in South Africa by giving them a chance to discover and read and talk about modern poetry, much of it written after 1945. Later, Milan explained that the two-part structure was a ploy recommended by a conservative publisher's reader as a way of getting the approval of the even more conservative book committees. So you have the two parts. One is the kind of the necessary part, and the other one is kind of a free-for-all for people to do whatever they want. It was a publishing strategy. So why the focus on contemporary and modern poets? Relevance was not the only issue. The poet has, through writing the poem, become more aware of what these experiences really mean to him, Malan commented again in his gendered way. And so if the poem works for you, he added, addressing the student reader, you will have been made more aware of some experience of life which you yourself have either had and not really thought about or not had and are now capable of understanding more completely. This is very close to the late group's pedagogical philosophy. Like them, Milan put lived experience first and understood poetic language as a means of giving it shape and significance. Um, though like Chanel, he also saw reading as a means to an end. In this case, the end being the appreciation not of beauty or rhythm as Chanel had it, but of some experience of life. Again, think about Reddy's conduit metaphor, a direct, access to some experience beyond writing. To clarify this guiding idea, Malan turned to Robert Graves's 1929 poem, Warning to Children, which he placed as a manifesto-like statement at the beginning of the inspirational part two. The thing that strikes one more than anything else about the modern world is its kaleidoscopic variety, its contrasts, its contradictions, what Robert Graves calls in the first poem in this section of the anthology, the fewness, muchness, rareness, greatness of this endless, only precious world. These are the prefatory comments. For Milan, this was the point of reading poetry, which he saw as an ever-changing kaleidoscope onto the lived experience of life's fewness, muchness, rareness. That Graves' admonitory defense of poetry is also a forthright critique of empiricism appears not to have concerned him. Any child attempting to untie the string of sensory experience in an empiricist fashion will, as I'm sure all of you know, the visionary Graves insists, disappear into a solipsistic, infinitely regressive world of her own making. Again, as a 17 year old, I ignored all this editorializing. Though, as I now see, Graves' critical reflection on our ways of knowing may have helped me deal with my bewilderment about the Thomas and the Cummings, both of which appeared in the anthology's inspirational part two. What is perhaps most conspicuous about Inscapes now, however, is the narrow experiential range of Milan's own kaleidoscopic vision in 1969. Besides the Thomas, the Cummings, and a selection of British and Commonwealth poets, Part two included Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Robert Frost, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, as well as 14 modern and contemporary South African poets, all white and all but one male. The only black poet in the whole collection was the relatively obscure Jamaican H.D. Carberry. Again, as with the Ladybird keyword series, I missed out on the shakeup that came four years after I completed my school. Six, Milan, a close follower of the South African poetry scene, persuaded the very cautious Oxford University Press to publish New Inscapes, which added more contemporary poets from around the world and a wide selection of Black South African poets, including many of the leading figures of the 1970s Black consciousness generation. Despite OUP's worries, 
the ever more kaleidoscopic new Inkscapes so, sold slightly better than its predecessor. By the end, it was 270,000 copies against 205,000 of the first of the Inkscapes edition. And it was prescribed across all the racialized education departments, white, mixed race, and Asian, the only exception being the one controlling black education. A decade later, following the first democratic elections of 1994, Malan overhauled the anthology completely, reissuing it, re it again with OUP as the more encompassing Worldscapes, a collection of verse in 1997. By the way, Cummings' Grasshopper did not survive that, ever, that edit, but Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle did. In the final lecture, entitled Scant Cream, Sense, Nonsense, and the Reader Remade, I shall return to the conduit metaphor underlying Malone's changing kaleidoscope and David Livingston's equally beguiling claim about the knowledge conveyed through letters. Thanks very much. We can take some questions now from the audience. I think we'll start with the audience and see if we have anybody on Zoom <laughs> right now. Does anyone have anything? I have a question for you, Peter. Um, you know, having to do with the poetry scene and the reception of poetry and where it was being taught in South Africa at the time. I mean, you know, what is your sense of the ways in which young people were engaging with it. Um, so, I mean, one of the one of the really interesting things about all of this is that uh, um, when you look at, and it's one of the things uh, that we we could look at in the in the seminar tomorrow. When you look at what uh, Milan was doing for the revision, and I, I suspect he had been wanting to get on with that revision uh, for a number of years before finally managing to persuade. OUP, who were, who were at that point controlled by a very conservative editorial team um, uh, because they had been uh, seriously stung um, by various political issues uh, quite a little bit earlier. They were, very, they were very conservative, but they were also just cautious, cautious commercially because they wanted to make sure they sold their, their previous edition and they didn't have any remainders and so on and so forth. Um, so that's hence the first version of New Inkscapes is published as a supplement. But what's really interesting is that what, it, what he's picking up on and the, the black consciousness poets that he's including, sure, some of the big names like uh, Mongani Wallace and, and Mafika Gwala were, had their own collections being published, but he was picking up uh, an extraordinary number of um, one-off single poets from, from the most innovative uh, literary magazine of the late apartheid era called Staff Rider, which was published by Raven Press. Um, very, you know, uh, uh, always under pressure in the early years from the censorship system, uh, trying to close them down. But there, that was an incredibly interesting uh, initiative, by far the most interesting literary artifact of the apartheid era, in my view, of, of that kind of collective endeavor, simply because it was a, a platform that initially tried to be with no editorial control, uh, eventually the, the black right, because it was it, there, there was a, um, a, a man called Mike Kirkwood, who was a kind of the leading figure in, in the Raven Press at that time. And as a white uh, intellectual of a Marxist persuasion, he just didn't want to call the shots. So he wanted to have no editorial, in, just publish everything, open gate. And the, the black writers around him you know, eventually said, no, you can't do this. I mean, we've got to, we've got to make selections. So the, this kind of utopian moment of no editorial policy only lasted a, 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 a year or so. But, but it was an incredibly important platform for young community arts groups in townships across the country uh, for them to publish their work. And, it's an, and now it's a, it's a living, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's an artifactual expression to how much was going on. Uh, and there are some incredible poems that he picked out of that. Um, you know, by, by, I've chased up on some of them, you know, some of them never, never went on to do anything more, but just one-off poems and he's and included them in, in New Inkscapes. So he was, he was very aware of that, of that poetry scene and very keen to in, incorporate it. So it's a, a fascinating thing, but it's again, something that we can look at maybe tomorrow, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's very telling that that 
got used on every system, uh, on every educational uh, board uh, could use it, except the one that controlled black education. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, very much enjoyed your lecture yesterday and today. Um, I wondered if we might go back to the model, the reading model that you had up on the um, slide very early on in the lecture. And my question is, um, given that you... Uh, uh, that was the, is that Danton's communication circuit? The, the, the one that you've been using, yes, this one, yeah. So this is the, yeah, this is the revised one, or, or mm -hmm. there's, there's Danton's one as well. I'll get back to the beginning, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in the revised one because you sort of mentioned uh, Sarah Brillette's critique of it and... Um, so she's critiquing the Danton one. Right, excuse me, not the revised one. Yeah. Okay. I, I misunderstood. Excuse me. So, so then we've got all of them. Yeah. Right. So I, I suppose what I'm interested in is, you know, you've chosen to use the Adams and Barker one to almost model your talk and to, to give us a map to guide, guide us through it. I was wondering if you could talk about um, why you chose to do that as opposed to the one on the right, um, or as opposed to uh, a sort of self-developed model, if you might. Yeah. Um, from your own criticisms. Sure. Um, so you just, want the professor to answer this question, not the... Yes, yes. I'm, 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 I'm looking for the professor's opinion on, uh, on your alter ego's work and <laughs> um, whether he yeah. sees certain biases emerging from the use of this revised model in narrating this story. Yeah. Uh, no, so that's a brilliant question. Re really, really in interesting and good question. So... Um, uh, again, you know, something that we, we could talk about. I, I, I was going, going to make the seminar tomorrow very much more about method and those sorts of questions. So that, that's, that's what we will confront. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the professor guy's interventions in the 1990s, um, uh, that was very much along the lines of trying to address that problem. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, you know, if you dig back into my own sort of development academically, the, pro the professor's development, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of emerged out of a, uh, a, a slight an eclectic, but definitely a Marxist informed uh, South African tradition of the 1980s. You know, that was my kind of undergraduate formation uh, in various ways. But I was always very dubious about the cruder forms of that. And they were, you know, they were very straightforward. Uh, um, you know, the South African Communist Party was one of the most unreconstructed communist parties after 1956. And there was a lot of very uh, you know, sort of conservative, crude Marxist thinking about determination in particular. And I was always worried about that. And, and, and it was one of the reasons uh, um, that, that I, I uh, was a professor guy, latched onto Bourdieu, because Bourdieu was dealing with those problems from a French Marxist perspective. Um, and very much, again, post-1956, Parti Communiste Francais. And, and he's thinking about that background. And so the, 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 the very elaborate sociology of fields that Bourdieu develops is all about trying to understand uh, structures of power in particular microcosms like a literary world, uh, which has you know, institutions like publishers and prizes, and they're very, they're very obvious concentrations of power and, and dynamics going on. He wants to understand those, but equally, and maybe in a sense inevitably because he was developing that as a major methodological tool in the kind of Bourdieu model, he often didn't pay enough attention to the other key issue that he wanted to say is that, well, we've always got to also understand that major external, for he said these things, but major external forces, like say political revolutions or technological developments, uh, have an impact on these, on these structures, uh, but they, have, they, they impact not by reflection, but by refraction. So he always talked about a prismatic effect and so on. So that, that was that was one of the things that I, I uh, that, that the professor took from Bourdieu to to bring to Danton's model. Um, I didn't want to elaborate on this here because it was in a sense it maybe a little bit too complex, too too much to include. Because all I really the only reason why I wanted to focus on the uh, the Adams and Barker model is that I I was interested in the way that they tried to uh, just simply visually uh, re rebalance. The, the, the issues to do with Danton's model, where Danton puts, in a sense, the bigger dynamics and forces as a sort of small set of intersecting Venn diagrams inside the circuit. They, they put it on the outside, which is broadly correct. Um, but then it's also, the, in a sense, one of the things that I was thinking that I could do in this kind of lecture, speaking in this kind of way, was actually 
try to find some evidence for, well, okay, let, let's see, how does this work? And, and is there a way, how do we trace these influences? So I'm, I'm always slightly worried about, you know, she's not the only one who thinks in these terms, but the kind of, the kind of analysis and language that you get from someone like Sarah Bluett, where there's just a presumption of certain sorts of influence. It's, it, it's almost like old, uh, um, um, you know, anti-mass culture views in the, in, the, in the 1950s that said, you know, this is just a top-down thing that shapes people's consciousness. And so you do try to find how can I, it's, 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 it's like the question, for instance, that Jan Radway dealt with in, in, uh, in reading the romance, you know, where she went and said, okay, well, you know, so there's this feminist critique of these romance novels, but let's go and see what are these women actually doing when they read, how do they read that? And then she got a much more complicated picture. So I was trying to, in a sense, using myself as a slight, as a, you know, obviously an idiosyncratic one-off um, source of evidence for uh, trying to trace the complexities of these things as you, as you try to track the, uh, the movement of a living brain through a very complex field of social and institutional forces. Thank you, uh, Peter. You can take this question as a question or as a comment, depending on whether you want to answer it. But I have to tell you that the work that I is doing in this presentation is quite remarkable. And I can point out um, many moments where um, it's hard, for example, uh, to reconcile the genealogy just traced from a kind of theory of determination to what the reading brain um, and some kind of, you know, uh, neurological determinism might, you know, that might suggest to then end up with experience as the, the category that you um, conclude with and that you make the most meaning out of in some sense. Um, there are other ways that I'm thinking about um, the way that you focus on a 17 year old boy, man, self person um, in relation to the professor, the eye of the talk, there's that. Uh, and then I, I was kind of wondering about um, how secret is the secret life of books? Is this inner appropriation? You know, I, I don't know what to say. There was something about um, not a seamlessness or a kind of a logic, but there was a, a kind of, of course, so that what you're describing is not just the eye, but this is how books work um, through the secret and not so secret. Um, yeah. life. And so that was the kind of uh, meta level reflection. I'm just going to conclude by saying you reminded me of hearing William Kentridge speak maybe about 14 years ago in um, San Francisco. And, um, uh, you know, I suppose you could think about that also as a performance between uh, multiple eyes. But one of the things that he said that has stayed with me for many years was in response to someone asking him about why theater or why did you take to theater in the 1970s in South Africa? And he said, well, it would have been absurd for me and anyone else to be installing light sculpture, mm -hmm. um, you know, a reference to New York minimalism or that art in South Africa, politically committed art, socially committed art would have to take the form mm -hmm. um, that it did elsewhere. But, you know, I don't know what the connection is for me yet in my thinking brain or whatever it is between that story and yours, but I really was reminded of it. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, well, I, I, I would prefer to take that as a, as a, as a wonderful comment, uh, but, but maybe it is also an opportunity for me to say something about why I chose this as the, as the headline uh, thing um, for, for these. Uh, so it's, call, it's called uh, Secondhand Reading, um, and it is a, it's a book, but it's a book uh, by Kentridge. So this is William Kentridge's Secondhand Reading from 2014. And uh, what, he, what he's done is he's using the 1933 revised uh, Oxford English Dictionary. And he's kind of, he's, uh, it's an extraordinary project. He's stripped it out, repaginated it in, in all sorts of ways. So the, you can't quite see the page numbers, but there's, there's 33 and, the, yeah, you can. There's page 33 and page 237 alongside each other. So there's a gain and wake. Um, and, so he's just repaginated them. And, and, and of course, those repaginations invite a new kind of reading when you start to think, uh, is there some, is he trying to create some connection between these pages that wouldn't be in the normal one? And then of course, he's, he's illustrated them and, and added his own layers of things uh, onto them so that it, it, it is both this kind of strange bit of book art, but it's also a flip book 
So, and some of them do work as, as movement. So you can, which he's, he's done in a lot of other projects as well. But the, the reason why I, I, I for some reason, I, I right at the beginning of thinking about what I was going to do for these lectures, I just had Kendridge in mind. And in fact, I had his megaphones in mind. Uh, so he does these uh, sculptures as well with his kind of tripods with a megaphone. And it's partly um, Kentridge's really, real interest in, uh, um, uh, you know, old political utopias and the kind of ideologues who to champion those. And they often are the ones with the megaphones. They are the megaphones. And the, the other, if I mean, entering into world Kentridge is a little bit here, but the, but the other, one of his other big, uh, you know, iconic. Um, tropes running through his work is tree, the, the organic tree. Um, so, so for me, it was, uh, I've always thought of the professor as being a bit of a megaphone. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, it's, it's got a little bit of self-portraiture to it. But as you'll see on Thursday, um, it also has the word wake on it. Um, so it's, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary piece. And, and that, um, the secondhand reading was also, apt, I thought, completely apt for what I was trying to do. And um, in, in, in an attempt to answer your question, I, I suppose I do think that um, we do, and I've tried various writing strategies, various speaking strategies over the last 15 or so years of trying to bring, you know, the deep experiential, and in my own case, you know, multiply transformative uh, um, engagements with certain literary works um, into what we do as scholars and academics, there, there is a way in which we, I mean, it's, I, I, find it, I find it a constant challenge. I never feel like I succeed, but trying to find a way which is uh, um, doing justice to that experience, but also, you know, ideally not in a navel gazing, self-oriented way, but an other oriented way, but in a way that, that also doesn't, I don't mean by that to discredit good basic scholarship. In fact, I still have, I, you know, I, with doctoral students, I just want them to good, you know, go off and do some really good research, find stuff out that people haven't known. You know, you know, we don't need another interpretation of X or Y, um, but actually go and find some stuff out. And, you know, and, and it's one of the reasons why I've, I've, you know, in my teaching and in the professor guys, that I've, I've promoted book history amongst uh, my own students is to just the opportunity. And they all... I've never, never found a body of students who don't respond to that possibility of finding evidence that nobody's talked about before, even about some major canonical work, because they just happen to be looking at a source. You know, like, for instance, I've just been involved in a, in a big project on PEN, the, the writer's organization. And this is a vast archive at the Harry Ransom, which is almost untouched. And you can imagine over 100 years, having major writers gathering annually to talk about the state of the world and the state of literature, there's, there's, there's an extraordinary trace of material of uh, the most remarkable kind. Um, and so there, there are ways in which, again, I think we have to think again about what we do and, and how we do it um, and what we look at. Um, Please join me in thanking Peter McDonald for a wonderful second lecture. <laughs> We're looking forward. <laughs> We'll be back here on Thursday for the third and final lecture, but if you can make it tomorrow, 10 o'clock, Lee Library, would love to have you. Yep, great, thank you.